With the damage system now fully implemented, we've got the enemy bat taking damage and actually being killed or removed from the world. We've got most of that set up and ready to go for the player. Of course, at the moment, the player's only receiving damage. We're still going to call this default print string, which is just to remind us in the player died function that nothing's been set up. So let's jump over there now and we can start getting this worked on and we'll consider what needs to be done for the player died scenario and how we can implement this. Okay, so the first thing is we know we're already tracking this B is dead value, which is going to be quite important to us. So we'll delete the print string to get started. We will alt drag in the B is dead. And we'll just be sure to set this to be true. So again, that we know that all of our checks for whether or not we should take any further damage is based on this. We can actually remove this from here. We don't need to do this twice. This would probably fit a little bit more nicely inside of the function handling the player dying now. But this means that this is now tracked and we won't take any further damage and we won't play this response that we're about to set up now more than once. So inside player is dead or player died, we're going to set the boolean here. This is just like I've mentioned, a little bit cleaner. Now, the first thing I think I want to do is take the input away from the player. So we don't want them to be able to carry on running, add any kind of final input to this. So the very first thing we're going to do is call a function on the player controller. So we we'll use the get player controller and we'll call the disable input function. Just make sure that this is hooked up to the right place. So the player controller is going to be the player controller target and the actual target for the input to be disabled is ourself. So now when we die, this means that if we're pressing forward, backwards, or anything like that, we won't be able to jump or move in any direction. And again, this is very simple to test. What I'm going to do is come back to the damage and we'll promote this to a variable as well, the base damage for when the player is damaged. So if we promote this to a variable, we can change this from anywhere, which will again, just make this a little bit easier for us. And I'll just call this one player damage. Now, ideally we're gonna change this based on the thing that we're hitting, but again, very simple project to get things going. This can be easily changed later but this will just allow us to now very quickly change this to 100. And it means that when we're working inside of our player died function, if we ever want to test this now, we can come straight into the game, get hit by the enemy. We can see we've died. And now if I keep trying to move, jump movement, everything like that is disabled. So first check is done here. We have this bit working. So if you remember previously, I mentioned that I wanted to replicate again that Mario or Sonic retro kind of 2D death animation where you fly up into the air and off of the screen. So we already have something very similar working, but instead of using the character movement impulse, this time I'm gonna move the whole thing. So we're going to take the capsule component, and as this is the root component, obviously everything is kind of nested below this for movement. We're gonna grab that and add impulse to that. We're also gonna to have to remember to disable all of the collision to allow us to merge through the floor. So if we control drag in our capsule component, we can, first of all, to allow us to do this, we need to set the set simulate physics to true. And we'll just hook this straight back up. If we didn't do this, we're going to get a warning when we tried to do anything like adding forces or impulses to something which by default doesn't have the physics simulation enabled. We can see here simulate physics is set to false, which means if we try doing anything physics related, we get a warning or an error kind of message come up. I'm going to press control W to get the capsule component again. And now that we have that in place, we can pull from here and we'll make the add impulse function. So very similar to what we did through our character movement component, we can do the same thing here. We're going to set the velocity change to true. We'll split the structure pin here. And I'm going to make the impulse this time a little bit more dramatic. So we'll set this up to something like 800 or maybe 900. So it's clearly higher than just being hit. So again, if we come in and press play, we can test this. And it's not quite working. Remember, I mentioned the other thing is the collision. So I think that's going to be high enough. The problem is we were immediately kind of punched out of the air because we're still taking in our hit responses. But I mean, this is fine. We get some funny results from doing these and we're testing that things are working and how they're responding as we go along. So we're just currently rolling around. Not quite the response that we want, but we're definitely getting closer. Now, again, we want to make sure that all of this is being accounted for in the right direction. So the first thing we want to do, we don't want all of these to be played potentially before we've disabled our collision. So I've just made a bit of space here. I'm going to control W the capsule component again. Again, this is just to save wires going from multiple places. This starts looking a little bit messy. I'm going to pull from here and we're going to set the collision response. 
We can set this to all channels. We're not going to need to worry about this missing anything because, of course, at this stage we're dead. Uh, all we know is we want this to ignore collision responses on every single channel. By channels, if you're not familiar too much with the collision settings, we've got the collision presets. These are the channels. We've got tracing, overlapping, and block, and the different things that we can either trace, which would be uh, things like raycast to check casting into the world if we've hit something or are looking at something overlapping for things which won't block the other object, but just detect that you've entered the same space. And then blocking, which is what we're doing, where we're physically moving things out or potentially hitting them with an almost physical response. So we're going to set all of these to ignore. So none of these will block anymore. You can see most of them are set to block. We'll set this to ignore, which means we'll also start doing things like falling through the floor. We're not even going to respond to the floor's collision response, which is ideal because remember I said part of the setup is making us fall out of the level. So we're jumping up and then falling through the floor. So that is pretty good. We can see again, more issues here. So what we're getting a problem with now is the camera is colliding with things that we didn't have problems colliding with before. So what we want to do, if you wanted to keep the camera attached and stop this from happening, we're gonna to go to the spring arm and we can see we've got the do collision test enabled. And basically what was happening when it was flickering, the spring arm, remember we've got this long arm here, is trying to adjust out of the way if it's tracing into the world and detecting that there's something that we could potentially be colliding. So it's noticing that we're now clipping through this and it's trying to move the camera, which is why it looks a little bit jerky. We can stop this by unticking the do collision test. And again, we'll try this again to see the new results. So what we should see now is we're still going to merge through ourselves, but that's fine. Um, we can change the Y offset or something if we wanted to override that. But the main thing is we don't have the camera jumping around. Generally though, this is going to kind of show that we don't have an entire level around us. This isn't what you would be used to in those kind of old school games. So what we're going to do instead, uh, that is just one fix. The way that I'm going to approach this is we're going to grab the spring arm component. We will pull from this and we'll use the detach from component. So this already knows what component it is attached to. It's attached to the capsule component, as you can see here in the hierarchy. But this is going to take the spring arm. It will detach from what it is attached to at the moment. It's going to keep the location and rotation. We might need to update these and it will stay where it is in the world. And this is more what you were used to seeing is the player kind of flying up and out of the screen. So this is relative. We don't want this to be relative because it is currently relative to the capsule component. We want this to keep its position in the world. So not where it was relative to its owning component. If the spring arm is moved over here, we want it to stay over here when the player dies, because you saw that that kind of flew down to the corner of the screen. And there we go. So we now have the player jumping up, the camera staying where it was, and we're avoiding all of that clipping issue. We can still kind of see the players going through the floor, uh, but again, in this case, not overly important. If you wanted to, when this happens, you could do something as simple as you could add a very small impulse on the Y. So if we just add an impulse of like one or something, this will put us slightly ahead or behind of the floor. Uh, the enemies have disappeared. That one didn't kill me. And there you go, a very small impulse. And again, if you wanted them to fly behind the floor, and you can see that the difference there is that he fell behind the hill. And if you wanted, you could get slightly creative with this. You've seen how to add different offsets. Again, using a select, you could add something like a random Boolean select and 50-50% of the chance you could get them to fly forward with a select node here. And same for the X. If you find it boring that they're always just going straight up and straight down, you could add a random chance for them to fly left or right. Now the final things I've been doing all of these tests when I'm stood perfectly still. If we're moving towards the bat, you can see something strange like that happens though. We get a little bit too much force with different forces being applied to each other. So I think what we need to do before all of this happens, we're also going to stop that movement. So we'll disable the input and stop the movement that we have. And just to say, going back to this very quickly, if you wanted to apply different impulses to the X and the Y and apply that randomly, then I'm not going to go through that at this stage. We've done very similar things multiple times. This would be a good kind of learning test for yourself between topics. Just give the videos a pause and see if you can implement this yourself. Take some of the select nodes that we've been using, some of the random check, put those together, and you pretty much have the result for some random impulses here. So the next thing with this stopping of the momentum node, we already have this being done. We're already copying code here, which is never ideal. So what we're gonna do, probably familiar with this now as well, we're gonna select two of these, we're gonna collapse this to a function, and we'll name this one cancel movement. Of course, we're going to delete these down here. We can drag in our cancel movement and we'll just hook this up to the false pin. 
So we're doing exactly the same thing. Now the impulse is slightly different. We could pass in different overrides if we wanted, but I think in this case, these two are kind of unique enough, not warrant dropping this into a function. I think that would be a little bit more of a hindrance to our code progress than it would help us. But in this case, we can take the cancel movement one more time, go into player died, pull from here, find the cancel movement function and hook these up between the two execution pins. And this just means now, if we try this again, what we should have is that movement canceled. Uh, we can say that's not the case. So this isn't picking up velocity. I think the problem being is that we're not getting velocity from the character movement. I think instead we're getting velocity from the capsule component. So we can either replace or just do a kind of fail safe and zero out both, which is the option I'm going to go for. And what we want is on the capsule component, it's a slightly different name. It's the linear velocity. It's the all physics linear velocity that we're looking for. So the easiest way is just to type linear, slightly long-winded. So we want to set all physics linear velocity to zero. And then we can try this again. And I think that should solve everything now. So if we go and find the bat, yeah, there you go. So we're getting rid of all of the movement. The velocity was actually being calculated on the capsule component, not the character movement. But again, there may be cases where this changes. So just in case, I'm going to leave this in. Uh, but we can see that now, regardless of how we're moving, it's going to cancel that out and we're going to apply that force. Just the force that we wanted though, which is that vertical velocity to replicate that old school dying animation. So that is pretty much everything you can, like I've mentioned a few times now, you can come in and really kind of start polishing this up. Another thing you may have noticed is that when we die, we're just entering the jumping and falling animations because that's what's being tracked. We don't really have anything as a death animation. So if you wanted to import one, you could bring that in. And like I've mentioned, adding new animation states should be as simple as adding a new movement state, which is our enum that we've exposed here. You could add after the jump before you could have a death animation and then adding this to be tracked. So again, as simple as in the player update flip book functionality, check here. You could even do another branch entirely. So rather than adding things on to this stream of logic, it could be as simple as if player is dead, then play the death animation or stop all animation. If it's not dead, then continue to check which movement based animation we should be setting. And then just adding that extra pin in here for the death animation. So again, just to recap why we've gone with this kind of automated approach, it's not fully automated, but you can see how much easier it is to plug in just one new movement state than it would have been to have an extra set of branching logic to the side. Uh, so between the topics, again, if you wanted to pause and do that type of thing, just for that kind of refined polish, then do feel free. It's not something that we'll be adding in in the topics, but that does mean at this stage, when I done with the enemies and the player, they're all interacting pretty much as expected and as we wanted them to. We can now move on to the final topic, which is going to be the interactive classes, the pickups to replenish health and that spring item to act as a kind of jump pad and provide a slightly more interesting level to maneuver around. So if you've been enjoying this topic, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, hit the notification bell so that you'll get the updates as soon as the next topic in this playlist goes live. And remember, if you wanted access to the full mini course all in one go, you can get that through the Skillshare link down below or through the gold tier Patreon or above rewards. Just wanted to give a big thank you to all of the people already supporting me over on Patreon. It is, of course, your support that allows me to make the more in-depth topics like this mini course for the channel. As ever, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.